On Christmas Day, 1950, four Scottish students from the University of Glasgow broke into the Westminster Abbey in London and stole the Stone of Scone and took it back to Scotland. Three months later, it turned up 500 miles away at the high altar of Arborhoth Abbey. <clears throat> it was just sitting there. <laughs> in, in 2008, the incident was actually made into a film called The Stone of Destiny, if you've ever seen that. It's an interesting film. <clears throat> Historical records say the Stone of Scone was an ancient stone upon which Scottish monarchs had been crowned for many years. It was taken from the Scone near Perth, Scotland by uh, King Edward I of England. A lot of times he was, uh, had the nickname Longshanks. <clears throat> But he took that in 1296 during the Scottish Wars of Independence as a spoil of war. <clears throat> by, the, by the order of King Edward I, the coronation chair was ordered to be made, which would enclose this famous stone of scone, which he placed in the care of the abbot of Westminster. Subsequent English and then British monarchs were crowned sitting upon the chair with this stone under it. At the time, the stone was viewed as a symbol of Scottish nationhood. Um, and by removing it to London, King Edward was actually declaring himself King of Scots as well. Queen Elizabeth II was crowned sitting on the throne with the stone in place in 1953 at Westminster Abbey. The British monarch has a long success, succession of royal family. They can trace their royal lineage uh, far back with connects with many other royal families from the different European nations. <clears throat> To give you an idea, Daniel's excited about this. <laughs> but just to give you an idea, this here has got an outline of all the different kings of Europe, mostly in the western parts of Europe. And they pretty much start all up there with Charlemagne, which, according to Ancestry.com, he's one of my great-great-grandfathers, but so I'm in here a few places, but <laughs> but anyways, you can see that there's there's a lot of connection with all these different kings that are there in court, including the royal family, that is all connected. So they have a long history that can go back. <clears throat> now in the historic sections of the Bible. There's a monarchy which begins with King David and continues to the time when the Babylonians conquered uh, Jerusalem in, in Judah. In these scriptures, there is a promise by God that David's reign would be forever. Today we will look at those scriptures to determine if this truly meant forever. Did David's reign end at the time of the Babylonian capture? Or some believe when Jesus was born? Or is the reign of the Davidic line to continue until the return of Christ? Let's find out the answers today. For a title, Davidic, Davidic Lineage. Davidic Lineage, which means the lineage of David, if you want to put it that way. Now this message is a continuation of messages on prophecy that I began a couple months ago. In those messages we saw that God promised 
in the Garden of Eden, a Messiah who would redeem all mankind. And this promise was passed to Abraham's descendant with the addition of a royal reign with many nations of peoples and kings. Now we read in the Bible the promise of the great nations was given to the descendants of Joseph. And the royal family was given to Judah, who passed this along to his son Perez, who is in the line of Jesus of Nazareth. We read scriptures and historical accounts which showed the migration of all these Israel, Israelite tribes. We also saw that the descendants of Judah's other son by Tamar, um, Sarah, um, held royal titles in other lands like Athens, Troy, and Spain, where they migrated to, and finally they settled in Northern Ireland around 1000 uh, BCE after a treaty with the tribe of Dan, who settled in Southern Ireland. Around the same time, in the Holy Land, David became king of Israel. He would reign for 40 years. After David, his son Solomon would reign for 40 years. <clears throat> Let's read what God promised King David. If you want to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. In uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, the, the prophet Nathan reveals the promises to God, of, of God, to David that his throne would be established forever, as well as his son, he's referring to you know, Solomon's uh, throne as, as well here. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 8. Now therefore thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the eternal of hosts, I took you from a sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of great men who were on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, and they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppressed them anymore as previously. Since the time I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all of your enemies. Also the eternal tells you that he will make you a house. Here God is saying that he's going to make a royal dynasty. Verse 12 when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Here, God is speaking about Solomon. Verse 13, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. <clears throat> I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity... I will chastise him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Now this is interesting since we know that Solomon did move away from obeying God towards the end. But God said that he would chastise him, but he would not depart from him. Uh, verse 16 and your house and your kingdom, speaking to David here, and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Forever. Okay, now in Brown, Driver, and Briggs uh, Hebrew definitions, Olam, Olam, O-L-A-M. Olam means a long duration, um, iniquity, uh, futurity, uh, forever. It means everlasting, evermore, perpetual, eternity. 
In Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, it says, Then the eternal God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Same word. Olam. Forever. Genesis chapter 12 and verse, or I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 9 and verse 12. And God said, and this is a sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual, for perpetual generations. Perpetual there is olam, meaning forever. He's speaking here to Noah. Verse 13, he says, I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So, perpetual is another word it can be translated to. Exodus chapter 3, or Exodus chapter 31, and verse 16. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. Olam. Forever. Verse 17. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Olam. Forever. In all these scriptures, the Hebrew word olam is used to show that there is no end. It is for eternity. There is no end. In 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, it says, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. This last line is a reference to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who Scripture tells us does indeed stem from the lineage of King David, and whose kingdom we know truly will have no end. Will have no end. These promises, known as the Davidic covenant, are especially interesting since God doesn't place any sort of conditions upon it. He simply explains to David through the prophet Nathan his plans for David and David's lineage. These plans rest entirely on God's grace, mercy, love, and faithfulness. Not on anything that David does for him or even whether or not the people cooperate. Again, verse 16 refers to the Messiah's everlasting kingdom. There is no conditions. Psalm 89, Psalm 89, um, verses 34 to 37 describes this as a perpetual covenant. It says, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out from of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness... I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever in his throne as the sun before me. And it shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. Shalah. This promise becomes even more specific in Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 7, it says, for thus says the Eternal, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. The house of Israel. None of these sections mentions that David's heirs, especially the Messiah, must trace their roots through Solomon. It's through David. The great prophet Jeremiah then mentions this promise in Jeremiah chapter 33. And he, and he says it this way. As I already mentioned here, but it says, David should never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. 
And it says, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that there will not be a day and a night in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. We still have night and day. It hasn't been broken. <laughs> it's forever. It's forever. Think about this. God is saying... This dynasty established in David is something that he truly invested in. It is a straightforward reading of even the prophet of a statue of Jeremiah tells us that there's something going on here. Now let's look at Luke chapter 1 to see what the archangel of Gabriel told Mary, the mother of Jesus. Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1 and verse 30. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. There will be no end. Acts chapter, um, in Acts chapter 2, verses uh, 29 through 36, Peter says the same thing when he's addressing the people after the Holy Spirit came upon them on Pentecost, that first Pentecost. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, it says, Behold, the days are coming that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the eternal our righteousness. These passages show that Jesus is destined to sit on the throne of David. Some biblical scholars and church leaders says that Jesus fulfilled this already. But that's not true. Jesus at his first coming did not assume the throne. As he compared himself to a nobleman who went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. That's in Luke chapter 19, verse 12. It will not be fulfilled in full until he returns. The Bible plainly says that God will establish his kingdom when Christ comes a second time to earth. You can jot down uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, and Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. It says that. God guaranteed that the house of David, his descendants, would continue to exist forever. Another quote there is in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 7. It says that. When Jesus returns, he will establish the kingdom of God on earth, and there will be no end to his reign. This has not happened yet. Because David's descendants did not continue to obey, some have mistakenly believed that God was released from this covenant with David. Yet this was not the case. Of David, God said in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 15, my mercy shall not depart from him. It's plain and simple. Let's look to the scriptures to see what happened to this Davidic lineage. In 1 Kings chapter 12, Rehoboam, you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to go through some of this here, but... Um, you can jot down 
1 Kings chapter 12. In there, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, became king. But not over all of Israel. Uh, God told a servant of Solomon, Jeroboam, that the kingdom would be divided and he would reign over ten tribes. So King Rehoboam only reigned over three of the tribes. His kingdom was known as Judah, while Jeroboam maintained the name Israel for his kingdom. They were split into the north and the south kingdoms. David's lineage remained in Judah for many, many years. Some obeyed God, and many didn't, as kings over Judah. King Josiah was the last good king of Judah who restored the proper worship to God, and he destroyed the pagan altars and the idols. He began his reign at the age of eight years old, and he ruled Judah for 31 years. Josiah was killed in battle against um, Necho, the king of Egypt. Three of his sons and a grandson would go on to reign over Judah as king before the kingdom of Judah fell to the Babylonians. Josiah's son, Jehoahaz, was 23 years old when the people made him king, and he reigned for only three months in Jerusalem. Then the king of Egypt took him captive to Egypt and made, um, made his brother, Eliakim, uh, king over Judah, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did evil in the sight of God, like everybody else. They did evil. So God sent Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came up against him, and he carried him off to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried off some of the articles from the house of the Eternal at that time, from the temple to Babylon, and put them in his temple at Babylon. This is also the time that he took Daniel and his three friends captive to Babylon. Now, then his son, Jeho Jehoiachin, reigned in his place. He was also named by, or known by the name um, Jeconiah, which is mentioned in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It's also in Matthew chapter 1 in Jesus' genealogy. And he's also known by um, Konia, in Jeremiah chapter 22. Uh, John Gill and other commentators uh, say that he was so nicknamed by way of contempt. Um, Jeconiah was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months and ten days. Three months and ten days. And he did evil in the sight of God. And Nebuchadnezzar summoned him, and he took him to Babylon with some costly articles from the house of the eternal. He ransacked it again. Um, it was at this time that Ezekiel, the prophet, was taken captive to Babylon. Uh, Jeconiah was cursed by God in that none of his offspring would ever sit on the throne of David. Then Nebuchadnezzar made Mataniah, which was Jehovah's, uh, Josiah's son and Jeconiah's uncle, he made him king and changed his name to Zedekiah. It's more likely that Zedekiah chose that name for what it means. But um, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. Zedekiah was the last king to sit on David's throne in Jerusalem in Judah. The Babylonians captured him and his sons 
as they were trying to escape. Uh, they were brought before Nebuchadnezzar, which is mentioned in 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 25 and verse 7. 2 Kings chapter 25 and verse 7. And it's also mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 39 and verse 6. They killed the sons of Zedekiah right before his eyes. Then they put out his eyes and took him to Babylon captive. Zedekiah watched as the heirs of the throne were murdered right before his eye. It was the last thing he saw because they put out his eyes and took him captive. It was at the end of the Davidic lineage on the throne. That's the question that we need to answer. Was that the end? Was it over? Was there another throne that was going to, another one descendant of David that was going to sit on that throne? God said the throne of David would be forever. So how is this possible? How did this occur? After they were all, the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar, he set Jeremiah the prophet free. And he set up a governor over Judah. Now this governor, he was killed by a, a military um, man named Ishmael, who also carried many of these other Jews. Um, the story is related in Jeremiah's uh, chapter 40 and 41. But Ishmael began to take some of the Jews, including the daughters of the kings, uh, to the Ammonites. Uh, most likely, he was taking them there um, to sell them in slavery. But Jehoahan, Jehoahan um, which was a principal captain of the forces, um, he actually rescued them in Ishmael got away, but he didn't, he didn't get the, the bounty on the caps of captives that he had taken. Now, Jehoahan, uh, Jehoanan, I hope I'm saying his name right, um, he asked Jeremiah to seek God's will for them in Jeremiah chapter 42. What is the will of God? What do we do now? God told Jeremiah that the people should stay there. Stay there, and God would protect them. God would protect them. God was very adamant in telling them that they should not go to Egypt. But this general decided he was going to go there anyways. So in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 43, he takes everybody there, including the king's daughters. and Jeremiah, and Jeremiah's scribe, Baruch. <clears throat> the kings of the daughters. Who are these daughters? Brother Jeremiah was given a great commission by God that many people just don't understand. Many, many scholars don't understand the commission that was given to him. But this prophet was called. When was he called? Jeremiah chapter 1, if you want to turn there. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 4. Then the word of the Eternal came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Verse 10, see, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms 
to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. Jeremiah's commission has always puzzled scholars. Scholars can't find where, well, scholars can actually find where Jeremiah rooted out, pulled down and destroyed and threw down kingdoms. You know, history shows that his prophecies about the destruction of the kingdoms that he prophesied against, it actually came, a lot of this came true. The mystery is, is where did Jeremiah build and plant? Where did Jeremiah build and plant? The, script, the scriptural account does not contain any building or planting that we can see. John Gill's exposition to the Bible, when he talks about to build and to plant, he says, he says it's referring to the house of Israel, which may be applied to the building of the temple and the planting of the Jews in their own land after the return from captivity, which Jeremiah prophesied of. So a lot of them want to say that when they return from Babylon and restored everything, that this was that being fulfilled. Jeremiah wasn't around then. This prophecy, this thing about Jeremiah says that he was going to build and to plant. Probably while he was alive. Other commentators, they don't even mention the build and to plant part because they don't know the answer. They'll talk about everything else and explain how it is, but they, they, won't, they won't even touch this. At least John Gill tried to make an attempt. There's some confusion over Jeremiah's being put over the nations. What does that mean, over the nations? It appears that it meant that his prophet, you know, that maybe him prophesying against these Gentile nations as he did, maybe that could be it. You know, God says he set them over the nations, over the nations, not nations in general. Uh, the same with the word kingdoms, the kingdoms. There's probably more concern with the nations or the kingdoms of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jeremiah was to throw down and to build and plant the Israelite nations. We have to follow his trail to find where he accomplished his mission because he was given a commission. And he most likely fulfilled it. Jeremiah along with his faithful scribe, Baruch, accompanied the king's daughters into Egypt. Jeremiah chapter 43 says so. Now, Zedekiah, Zedekiah was only 32 years old when he was taken to Babylon. Um, that's mentioned in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 11. So his daughters would have been relatively young, uh, certainly in their early teens. Now history records their names as Skota and Tamar Tefi or Tia Tefi. Now Jeremiah was no doubt acting as a guardian for these young princesses. Of course, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, he killed Zedekiah's sons because he didn't want them to usurp him, you, you, you know, usurp him and try to become kings. He wasn't concerned about the daughters of Zedekiah. Again, they were forced against their will to go to Egypt. But Jeremiah knew that it was not safe to stay there as he was told by God that the Babylonians was actually going to come and conquer Egypt as well. He had to have gone somewhere else. The Bible doesn't reveal that, where he went. But history has many, many clues. But first, we need to look at Ezekiel. 
Remember, he was taken captive to Babylon. We need to, we need to understand Ezekiel's riddle. If you turn to chapter 17 of Ezekiel, we're going to take a look at this riddle that he gave. Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 22. Thus says the eternal God, I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out. I will crop off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I will plant it on a high and prominent mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it. And it will bring forth bows and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. Under it will dwell birds of every sort. In the shadows of its branches they will dwell. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Eternal, have brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree, dried up the green tree and made the dry tree flourish. I, the Eternal, have spoken and have done it. That's the riddle. Many scholars and commentators correctly identify David's throne as this high cedar on the mountain in acknowledging the royal family. Acknowledging the royal family. I have another One that you might want to check out afterwards. I'll have these set out that you can take a look at. But it kind of shows the biblical family. And there's a section in here which shows the different kings that descended, you know, that reigned over Israel and Judah. But this is an interesting thing. This shows uh, some of the royal family of the Bible. Take a look at that later. <clears throat> But let's ask a question. Who is this tender one in Ezekiel's riddle? That tender one. Who's the tender one? Now some refer to Zerubbabel, who returned from the Jewish exile as a governor. Um, but that's incorrect. And, and many actually point to Jesus as fulfilling this, even though he didn't. Now this may be a dual prophecy, as many are, which will be fulfilled when Jesus returns to set up the kingdom of God. But he didn't do this the first time. So what is the first fulfillment of this? The answer lies with the mysterious commission given to the prophet Jeremiah, which we already read. He was to build and to plant, as Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10 says. God said himself, said he himself would plant a tender one. God said this. He will plant that. Did he use Jeremiah in accomplishing this planting? According to what was mentioned about Jeremiah earlier, it was his destiny. It was his destiny. Now the now we know that the Jeconiah that Jeconiah's line was totally disqualified from ever inheriting the Davidic throne. And Zedekiah's sons had all been killed. So the term tender one, as used in Ezekiel's riddle, certainly applies to a young female. Could one of Zedekiah's daughters be used to perpetuate the throne of David. Would this actually be legal? Well, according to the Hebrew law, a man could pass the family inheritance on to a daughter if he had no son. That's outlined in Numbers chapter 27, verse 8. This may also apply to even the throne. 
the promise in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 17, that David would never lack a man to sit on his throne must not be taken to exclude women. There was an evil queen that sat on the throne temporarily. We won't talk about her. But but while the Hebrew word ish is used throughout the Old Testament to designate a male, the term is used frequently of humans in general. Moreover, the legitimacy of the maternal line is clearly held up in the fact that Jesus' own blood link back to King David is through his mother Mary. It's through his mother Mary. The tender one from Ezekiel's riddle is one of the daughters of Zedekiah. But let's, but let's look at the last part of this riddle. It says, In all the trees of the field, verse 24, And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Eternal, have brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree, dried up the green tree, and made the dry tree flourish. I, the Eternal, have spoken and have done it. Who is the high tree and who is the low tree? We know that the tree is the royal throne of David, or Judah, as the scepter will not depart from Judah. We've, we've seen that. In Ezekiel, chapter 21, verse 25, it says, Now you, O profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end, thus says the Eternal, Remove the turban. Take off the crown. Nothing shall remain the same. Exalt the humble and humble the exalted. Overthrown, overthrown. I will make it overthrown. It shall be no longer until he comes whose right it is. And I will give it to him. Capital him. Capital letter, him. One possibility here, the high tree is Judah. The low tree is Israel. The throne would be passed from Judah to Israel. This makes more sense when you think of which nations are considered to be Israel in the eyes of God. The United States and Great Britain. Another plausible view is that the scepter passed from Judah's son Perez to his other son Sarah. Historical records and the book of Jeremiah indicate that at the fall of Jerusalem in 588 BCE, the prophet Jeremiah and the daughters of the biblical king Zedekiah escaped to Egypt. This uprooting and later planting in another country done by Jeremiah is seen by some to fulfill God's prophecy through Ezekiel chapter 21 verse 26 where God promised to exalt him that is low the line of Zerah through Yokaid and abase him that is high the line of Perez, or Zedekiah. You follow me here? <laughs> this brings us back to my last message where I ended with the Israelites in Ireland. The Tooth of Dedana, the tribe of Dan, they had established settlements in Ireland. Uh, these colonies became more developed. Uh, ruling clans of Danite kings ar arose. Eventually, however, these kings were superseded in Ireland by the Miletians line of kings that made up the royal family, uh, the royalty from basically the Jewish lineage of Sarah, the son of Judah. Now this royal line, they actually developed when Dan, the Danite and the Judah 
Sarite refugees settled um, parts of ancient Greece prior to Israel's enslavement while in Egypt. The Malaysian line eventually made its way to Ireland. Jeremiah's mystery commission was to join the Davidic throne to the Irish throne through the marriage of Tephi, Zedekiah's daughter, to an heir of the Malaysian line, a prince named Eucade. Eucade. Some pronounce it Eucade. I'll spell it for you. E O C H I or A I D H. Pronounce Eucade. Or I I gotta get my really good Irish accent here. I know. <laughs> I'm going to try it. <laughs> but this is how Jeremiah was to plant a tender one in what would eventually become a high mountain, the Israelite birthright kingdom of Great Britain. As I mentioned in my last message, the Irish have many historical writings about their past. Many read like fantasies or tales of lore. Um, the Book of Invasions is one, uh, and there are many books that are entitled The History of Ireland. <clears throat> the Irish are well known for their dedication to recording their national history, which has been illustratively handed down in songs, poems, tales, and legends. As such, Irish historical figures have often been endowed with almost magical powers <laughs> which is kind of how the fur blog that was ruling there saw the Tooth of Dodonna, the, the tribe of Dan, when they came to invade them, they thought they were like superheroes or gods uh, just because of their technology. I mean, if you think about it now, you go to some primitive island that has never seen man, and you show up there, and they would think that we were gods. That, that happened in... And as you know, the Aztecs thought the Spaniards were gods, so it's not unusual. But but the actual events at times had been <laughs> obscured by embellishments, as they were told and, and retold by these Irish bards. Now, many of these tales and stories describe an old man of wisdom who traveled to Ireland with his scribe Barak and a certain princess Tephi. Jeremiah's exact name is never mentioned, but he is referred to as Olam, Olam Fodla, or Olam, Olam Fodla, which means an honored prophet. His scribe, Barak, is always mentioned, but he's various names of, you know, very variations of his name, but he's always mentioned, certainly. And the princess Tefi is sometimes called Tia Tefi or Tamar Tefi, and then Skoda, her sister, is also mentioned in various tales. Some betray her as an Egyptian princess um, whom the, the people of Scotland um, are so named, the, the Scotia, the, the Scottish people. But there are many tales about this Princess Tefi marrying this prince of the Malaysians. Archaeologist E. Raymond Kept um, has concisively described Jeremiah's planting of the Davidic throne in Ireland. According to Kept, Irish records tell us of a particular ship of the Iberian Dana, the tribe of Dan, coming to Ireland in about the year 583 BCE, a mere three years after the fall of Jerusalem. And this date varies with some other different accounts. Was, I mean, like I said, there's many accounts. But the ship of the Dana origin, meaning it was linked to a particular group of Danites who had earlier settled in Greece. It came to Ireland by way of Iberia, which was Spain. As the ship approached the northeast coast of Ireland, it ran aground near an area known today as um, Carrickfergus. 
though the very story, it is clear that the ship's passengers, there was an aged Hebrew patriarch called Olam Fadla, his attendant named Brock or Brack or Barak or Barak. I mean, a lot of different variations of his name in the different tales. Um, there's different various spelling in the legends, but it pretty much talks about the same guy and described as a scribe. And an eastern king's daughter called Tephi. Uh, T-E-P-H-I, Tephi. Again, Barak, his scribe, can clearly be identified from the variations of his name. The royal princess, Tephi, is identified in the arcades as the daughter and heiress of King Zedekiah. Her sister, Skoda, is said to have remained behind in Spain. Um, Jeremiah and his party apparently spent several months in Iberia. As John Fox writes in his classic book, The World's Greatest Throne, so various records include an account of the marriage between the royal princess and Yokad, or Yokade, the Harriman, or the king of Ireland. Uh, given the princess' name was Tamar, Tamar Tefi. Harriman, basically that means chief, as it was a title that was used of the kings. Yokade is traced in early Irish records as having descended from a particular, or from the patriarch Judah, through the Sarah line, through his son Sarah. Now, in the Lost Tribes of Israel study maps, researcher Daniel Walsh relates information taken from the 1886 work, The Book of Tephi, which was written by J.A. Goodchild which takes in the form of a 3,000 line poem. I'm going to read that whole thing. No, I'm just kidding. Um, he spent years studying the Irish um, legends. The poem records the journey of Teotephi, Jeremiah, and Barak from the house of Judah to the Isles of the West. The Isles are known as the home for the remnant of the tribe of Dan. The group left... Um, Tephanes in the Nile Delta aboard a Hebrew ship from Tarshish, or Iberia. The ship's pilot was a Danite. Based on Goodchild's poem, Walsh goes on to outline the journey. From Egypt, from Egypt the Danite ship stopped at Carthage, then Rome. Uh, the group then sailed to southern Iberia um, by Cartia, an area that's near um, Gibraltar. And there they stayed about five months. From there they made a stop brief at Tarshish, or Tartessus was another name for the place, before going on to Cornwall in southern England. A few weeks later the party made a short trip up the coast to eastern Ireland. Um, the Irish chieftains conveyed soon afterwards to confirm Yokade as Ard Rai, King or the High King of Ireland, the title, and Princess Teffy was also confirmed as queen, and a royal marriage was soon arranged. The poem also brings out Yoke's coronation was conducted over a unique stone brought to Ireland by Jeremiah called Leophale, which means wonderful stone, Leophale, by the Irish. They called it Leophael. This stone is apparently Jacob's pillar from Scripture and has been utilized in the coronations of all kings of Ireland, Scotland, and England who are traced back to Yokade of Ireland. During some of the king's coronations in the Bible, there is mention of, a king stand, of, the, of these kings standing near a pillar when they're being coronated. Other artifacts may also have been brought from the temple. It is said that Princess Tia, Tia Tefi, also had in her possession an ancient harp whose origins some believe lie in the house of David. Uh, some tales speak of a chest 
or an ark. Goliath's sword may have been brought as well. Uh, some tales mention a spear. But more important is that you have a royal wedding, wedding taking place uniting the two houses of Judah. The two houses of Judah, Perez and Sarah. Concerning Yokade, um, Walsh writes, one of Ireland's rulers was a man named Yokade Hiramon. Uh, Yokade is Irish for the Greek name Achios, and the term Hiramon is the, uh, the title meaning chief of the landsmen, or a king. He was a Malaysian living among the Tutha Dedana. His genealogy traces back to Kel Kelplo, which is mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 6, also mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 31. The Sarite, this was known, he was known as a Sarite, the Sarah, you know, the tribe of Sarah from Judah, they were known as Sarites, as I mentioned before. And he was also the founder of Athens, who is said to have planted a royal dynasty in Ulster in Northern Ireland. Thus Tephi, the heiress of the Davidic throne, married into an existing Jewish royal line which had been ruling for some time over the Israelites settled in Ireland. As the newly crowned queen of Ireland, Tephi brought the very authority of the throne of David to UK's reign. According to tradition, UK's coronation took place about 580 BCE, six years after the fall of Jerusalem. Ultimately, through their offspring, the tender twig would become a majestic cedar, as I mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. A new royal dynasty in its own right, through which the Davidic throne would be perpetuated. Thus, in keeping with God's sure promises that David's throne has remained active, ruling over Israel in all generations. The union of Tephi and Yokade has not only established a new dynasty over Israelite Ireland, it also resolved an ancient breach or division in the tribal family of Judah. As we know, this breach took place shortly before Jacob relocated his family to Egypt, resulting from this unusual circumstance surrounding the birth of Judah's and Tamar's twins, Zerah and Perez. Uh, Zerah was trying to come out first, as we remember, but Perez came out, became the firstborn, and received the blessing. Now that was restored. That unity was restored. The stone of scone was delivered to the hill of Terah, T-A-R-A, Terra in Ireland, where it remained until it was removed to Scotland. Around, around 503 CE, um, the prince, uh, the Irish prince, Fergus Moore McRae, or Fergus the Great, as he's known, was highly successful in his military efforts to annex parts of western Scotland. Uh, Fergus soon established a significant kingdom in Scotland and wanted to be officially recognized. As Capt notes, Fergus' intention was to style himself as the King of Scotland. Understanding the significance of the Stone of Destiny, Fergus had Leah Fael brought to Scotland for his coronation as king. The stone was never returned to Ireland but was kept in a sanctuary on the Isle of Iona. And like, like the Irish, every subsequent Scottish king was crowned on Lea Fael, or they also called it Lea Gael um, to the Scots. That's how they referred to it as. In 843, 843 CE, the Scottish king Kenneth Mac. Elpen, another relative of mine, 
<laughs> moved the stone to scone. Hence the stone's name, Stone of Scone. That's how it ended up with that name. As I mentioned before, in 1296 CE, when King Edward I of England conquered the Scots, he became overlord of Scotland. Leah Fiel was moved to Westminster Abbey in London. There, King Edward promptly had a special coronation chair built around the stone. The Scottish and English kingdoms were subsequently united in 1603 when James VI of Scotland, which was Mary, Queen of Scots' son, was crowned at Westminster Abbey and became King James I of England, the one who authored or had the King James Version of the Bible um, created for him. Every king or queen of Britain has been crowned in that very chair, and all British monarchs are considered Scottish. The Stone of Scone has much written about it, and many believe it was the Pillar of Jacob, which was used during the coronation of Davidic kings. It is a symbol of the throne of David, which is why Jeremiah brought it to Ireland, which means that all the kings crowned above the stone are continuation of the Davidic lineage of kings that God promised. Another interesting thing from Ezekiel chapter 21, which I had read, um, in verse 27, and I'm going to read from the, King, the original King James Version, since I just mentioned him, um, says, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Now verse 27 here seems to say that the throne would be no more, would cease to exist until centuries later with the coming of him who it belongs, Jesus Christ. But remember that God promised that David would have a descendant reigning on his throne in every generation. So it, it, a better translation of that is, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more overturned until he come whose right it is. That's how it should be read. The mention of overtime three times would seem to imply that the throne would be pulled down and moved three times. The first transfer was from Judah to Ireland. The second was from Ireland to Scotland. The third was from Scotland to England. The monarchy of, the, of Great Britain is the chief monarchy of David. King Charles III was just crowned king on that very chair with that very stone placed under it. He is in the lineage of King David. One day, when Christ returns, he will sit on that throne.